Well, good morning, Gospel Community Church, and uh, thank you, Brother Joel, for hosting this morning. Um, appreciate uh, everyone gathered here today, and uh, blessings to you all as we open up the Word of the Lord to Psalm 36. Uh, last week, as many of you know, uh, we were looking at the first uh, number of verses, verses 1 through 6. Uh, today, we're going to pick it up and read through verses 7 through 12 together. These are the words of God. How excellent is your loving kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of your house and shall make them drink of the rivers of your pleasures. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light shall we see light. I continue your loving kindness to them that know you and your righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of pride come against me and let not the hand of the wicked remove me. There are the workers of iniquity fallen. They are cast down and shall not be able to rise. Now as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. Amen. Well, the title today uh, is, uh, like it was last week, The Sinfulness of Men and the Supremacy of God, Part 2. Uh, last week we looked at uh, how man uh, naturally in, is inclined to wickedness and sinfulness, and uh, we looked at the great God Yahweh. Uh, part two will continue that journey, but in a reverse order. The psalmist in this half of the psalm will look at God's greatness and the blessing of being in uh, Yahweh and in Christ, uh, of being a Christian, uh, and then he'll look at the fall or the fate of the wicked. We'll look at it in a threefold way, looking at the outline here. Firstly, the provision of of the righteous, verses 7 and 8, God provides for his own, verses 9 and 10, the profession of the elect, and then thirdly, the pronouncement for the wicked, the psalmist will pronounce a, uh, an end benediction, so to speak, over the wicked in verses 11 and 12. This main point, again, is David is wanting to paint a contrast uh, between the evil wickedness of men and the divine goodness of God. The evil wickedness of men and the divine goodness of God. Now we know in the first half of Psalm 36, by way of introduction, uh, we have been given a, a fourfold picture of the wickedness of men outside of the gospel. Uh, of course, wicked man uh, was measured uh, we saw in those earlier verses by his transgression, by his iniquity, by his deceit, and by his putting off of what is good, or his hatred of evil is another way of saying that. And of course, although wicked men are measured by their own wickedness or their unworthiness, the worthy God is measured by his greatness. So you've got this picture here of the psalmist uh, looking in verse 5 at the the, the mercy of the Lord and his faithfulness, the righteousness in verse 6 of God, which is like the mountains and God's judgment, which is his great deep. The psalmist here is using the biggest things he can imagine uh, and the biggest things he can use to express in a natural terminology for how great God is in his magnificence, the character and the nature of God. It cannot be plumbed, uh, the depths of the oceans, the heights of the heavens, and so forth. So what we've got here in this psalm is a continuing window here today where we're looking at a high view of man and a low view, um, a high view of God and a low view of man. Uh, a high view of God in God's eternal, unchanging holiness and a low view of man, his inherent and permanent wickedness, uh, of course, outside of the gospel. Now, we also see in this psalm uh, the blessings of the one who lives under what the psalmist says is trusting in the shadow of the Almighty. 
This is verses 7 through to 10. We're going to look at that firstly today. Uh, and then secondly, we're going to see how the wicked are cast down uh, their hands and feet that practice iniquity and the end fate of those. So the first half of the sermon is a blessing pronounced on the righteous. The last half is a curse pronounced on uh, the wicked or those outside of the gospel. Uh, let's uh, have a look at our first point together. That is... Uh, The provision of the righteous, verses 7 and 8. Let's uh, be looking in your Bibles there at Psalm 36 as we look at these verses together. How excellent, the psalmist says, is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of your house, and you shall make them drink of the river of your pleasures. Uh, Amazing thoughts just in this couple of verses here where David paints a picture of God's provision for his covenant people. Now David in this last half of the psalm is focusing on the excellence of God or the Lord's, this is Elohim here, uh, the Hebrew word Elohim, his Elohim's loving kindness towards his people. A note, uh, a lot of people think God is a tyrannical despot, uh, some sort of uh, deistic um, you know, God that's sitting in the heavens and doesn't care. Uh, but in actual fact, the psalmist paints the Lord rightly here in that he is a benevolent, loving God. Uh, the way A.W. Pink says this around God's loving kindnesses, and by the way, that kindnesses is in the plural Uh, So God's just not loving kind once. He's loving kind all the time to his people. A.W. Ping says, It is the loving kindness of God that encourages poor sinners to draw near to God. It's attractional to the Lord. Um, To put their trust in him, he says, and to seek from him the mercy they need. He says, The justice of God gives men what they deserve. The loving kindness of God gives men what they need. Now, did you hear that? Uh, God is loving kind because if we all got what we deserve, we'd be in trouble. But God is merciful, but here he's particularly loving and kind. That's what loving kindness is. It's God's loving kindness towards his people that we don't get what we deserve. Well, what do we deserve? Well, we're sinners. We deserve hell. God in his loving kindness has intervened. And that's why I think the psalmist says his loving kindness is excellent. It's an excellent attribute of the Lord. His loving kindness is extended to his people. And Pink has really nailed it there. He goes on actually and says, as far as the gospel is concerned of God's loving kindness in Christ, he says, I am amazed that God who is so infinitely above us, so inconceivably glorious, so ineffably holy, should not only allow such sinful worms as we are to live in his universe, but also show us such marvellous loving kindness as to set his heart upon us, give his son to redeem us, send his spirit to dwell within us, and patiently bear with all of our infirmities and sins promising never to remove his loving kindness from us. I think Pink has very much described how God is so worthy, how we are so unworthy, and why he is so loving, kind to his people in the gospel. Now, there are some verses here we should look at. Uh, If you're looking in your Bibles, I've got them up on the screen here as well. Psalm 42, verse 8. The Lord will command his loving kindness. It's not something that just happens to us. Uh, but by circumstance, the Lord has commanded his loving kindnesses over our lives. He's commanded it in the daytime, the psalmist says, and in the night his song shall be with me. Psalm 26, verse 3. David said, your loving kindness is before my eyes. What a beautiful thing to set before us is God's loving kindness towards us as I have walked in your truth. For David... This loving kindness of the Almighty, that is knowing that God is loving and kind, causes believers to put their trust in Him, in in God, in the Almighty. Now, you may struggle to trust God, or a person may struggle to trust God if they see Him as a mean-spirited, arbitrary deity, but He is not. 
Notice the picture that the psalmist draws of trust. Have a look at it with me in the text. Uh, Verse 7, what are we? You can see it. The picture the psalmist draws is one where the believer comes under the what? The shadow of the wing of the Almighty. Have a look at it. We're not just near God. We're with him. We are under him. Under Elohim is who is over all things concerning us in his loving kindness. You know, one of the things God does as a loving kindness for us is he shelters us. He protects us. We come in under that covering. You know that terminology in Christianity where uh, women, you're under the, the covering of your husband. He's the head of the home. Uh, as a church, we're under the covering of Christ. Um, Christ. God is the head of Christ and Christ is the head of the church. And, and so we've got this beautiful picture of coverings uh, in scripture. And here we see in an Old Testament context, the beautiful picture of the saint coming under the covering of the Almighty under his wing or under his feathers so to speak. Now this picture shouldn't be unfamiliar to us in the Old Testament because uh, the shadow of your wings is a a common terminology here. Now some commentators take it in a spiritual sense and they say well it's the wings of the cherubim that were represented in the tabernacle of God uh, and the later temple. Uh, Of course, we know the cherubim's wings were depicted on uh, the top of the Ark of the Covenant and they spread out over the Ark, which was a representation of God's presence. So when we're under the the presence, uh, under the wings uh, of the Covenant, so to speak, of the Ark of the Covenant, you're under God's presence. The Ark was God's presence and the wings over that represented were something that you were under. So when you are under the wing, you're in the presence of God Uh, That is uh, certainly an Old Testament context. So in a spiritual sense, it's viewed that way. But in a practical sense, it's also viewed um, from a physical perspective of a young young chicks being gathered by their mother, the mother hen. And uh, they're being gathered under the wing to be protected, uh, to be hidden, and to be sheltered. Uh, I think both work, spiritual and natural analogy or interpretation in this context. This picture of divine protection uh, is seen in Psalm 91 verse 4. He will cover you, and maybe we'll just actually turn there, have a look at it together, Psalm 91 verse 4. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings shall you trust. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. So you've got this picture here, that wings are a refuge for the Christian, for the believer, for the church. His faithfulness is a shield and rampart. Notice that in the text, uh, we see in Psalm 36 that we are told uh, that we will put our trust under the shadow of the Almighty. A couple of things here is we're trusting in God and we're trusting that... We're trusting in his shadow. We don't get God automatically. We get his shadow. We know he's looking out for us. You know, the shadow isn't the real thing. The shadow is what we know is there, but it implies that someone is there. So when we're talking about their shadow, they may not phys- we may not be able to see them. We see their shadow, and this is exactly where the psalmist is going. God, I can't physically see you, but I know you're there, and I know you're looking after me, and I know you're looking out for me, and I know I can hide under the fact that you, in your loving kindness, is protecting me. And so I trust, even if I don't get to see you, I trust in your shadow. I trust that you're protecting me, and you're looking out for me, even though there is evil men and wicked men and sinners that would see my demise. That maybe in a New Testament context, we can turn and have a look at Matthew 23 for a moment. Uh, Spiritually, I've just spoken there, but in a physical sense, uh, Jesus in Matthew uh, 23, and we'll maybe just pick it here at uh, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets and stone them which are sent to you, How often would I have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not? As you can see here, the Lord's using this passage in the same sense that 
he would have loved Jerusalem to come under and gather them, gather his people. It's a picture of how God takes his people and protects them, gathers them, cares for them, brings them to himself. It's a picture of not just salvation, but taking refuge in the presence of God as a Christian. Now, we need to follow on in the text here uh, because we continue to go on and see some of these wonderful blessings that come out of this provision for the believer, for those who trust in the shadow of his wings. And there are these beautiful pictures here in verse 8. Uh, we see they are abundantly satisfied or the satisfaction that comes first from knowing that God is on our side. And then we see also in verse 8 this picture of joy, of drinking from uh, the river of God's delights. We see the fatness and the pleasure and the drinking that comes from being uh, in God's presence. This is the beautiful picture of uh, God preparing a table before us, even in the presence of our enemies. We are feasting in the face of our enemies. And uh, it goes on further in verse 9, and we see some of these other wonderful provisions. Uh, the provision of life. Uh, he is the fountain of life. He will not just keep our physical life, uh, but he gives us spiritual life. So firstly, we can look at that fountain of life as a, a physical thing, uh, a literal life, and then we can look at that second life as a spiritual life or light. Uh, by the way, there is no life without God's life and Him giving light as well. And so, this picture here in verse 9 of both life and light are pictures of God and what He provides to us. And these are all the things that David sees as blessings as we come uh, to trust in the shadow of the great God Yahweh. Now, in verse 8. There is this divine link here with the shadow of the Almighty, which I'm not finished on yet, and remaining in God's house. If you can see it there in verse 8, they shall be abundantly satisfied, they being those who have put their trust uh, in the shadow of the Almighty. So they've come under the wing, and where do they find themselves under the wing? With the fatness of your house. That is the house of God. So right now, when we're talking about the satisfaction or the blessing that comes under trusting God, we see less of a natural inclination to interpret this passage as a chicken, uh, as a hen with her chicks, but rather with a God and his presence. As we come into God's house, he is protecting us under the wings of the cherubim, so to speak, under the presence of the ark, uh, and the presence of God's house or his tabernacle. Now, of course, in God's tabernacle, if you went into the Holy of Holies, where God's presence was, or the ark was, the cherubim were over the ark in the Holy of Holies, and their wings stretched out over the mercy seat. Now, as we discovered last week, God's mercy is God's goodness, and God has been good and merciful to us in giving us his presence and giving us his son, this mercy seat, the Holy of Holies in the middle of the tabernacle. Now, maybe we can uh, turn there in Second Chronicles and have a look at uh, where it talks about this in Second Chronicles chapter 3. Maybe we'll pick it up. I've got verse 11, but we'll pick it up at verse 10. And in the most holy house, he made two cherubims of image work and overlaid them with gold. So this is the divine presence here that we're talking about, gold being the, uh, the um, picture of divinity. And verse 11, and the wings of the cherubims were 20 cubits long. One wing of the cherubims was five cubits. That's the one that was uh, in front and reaching to the wall of the house. And the other wing uh, was likewise five cubits. Sorry, that's the shorter one. The 20 cubits was the longer one reaching to the wing of the other cherub. So one reaches to the cherub, the other one reaches to the wall of the house. I need you to see this because in this particular uh, description of God's presence or the Holy of Holies, the cherubim reach out from one side of the Holy of Holies to the other. That is, when you're in God's presence, when you're in Christ, when you're in or under the shadow of the Almighty and trusting in Him, God's presence is from left to right. It is from front to back. There is no place that you cannot go where you are not in Christ under the shadow of the Almighty. So God's wings are there. 
And as Christians, we need to know that we're under the shadow of God's wing all of the time. We need to remind ourselves of that, though, that we're not trusting in man, that we're not trusting in flesh, that we're not trusting in our own schemes or plans, but we trust in the Lord God Almighty and we rely on his presence, on his power and on his strength to keep us going. And so in all of this, we've got this beautiful picture that the psalmist, you and I, the believer, look to the Lord, we look to his presence. We trust that he is with us. That he would never, as Jesus said, leave us or forsake us. Here is the picture of the wings of, that are covering the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, the covenant people of God are covered by the wings of God himself. Now as the high priest entered the temple once a year on the Day of Atonement, he did so not without blood, the book of Hebrews tells us. This picture of atonement for sin, the great high priest coming in, once and for all, this is Jesus, died for those who would believe on him as the high priest sprinkled uh, the blood on that day of atonement on the altar representing the presence of God that would come from the divine sacrifice of the Saviour. He did so with his finger. Aaron would go in and he would do so with a finger. Why with a finger? Well, if he did it with his hand, he had a hand to play. Saints, we have no hand in our salvation. We have no hand in the presence of God being freely offered to us in Christ. We are given this as a grace to us. And so the blood was sprinkled, Leviticus 16, by the high priest on the Ark of the Atonement. Uh, and of course, this beautiful picture where the blood makes way for the presence of God. And now Christ is with us. And this beautiful picture, verse 8, back in Psalm 36 now, if you're there uh, with me, we'll turn back there, gives us this picture, the psalmist gives us this picture that we will be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of your house. Now, of the covenant Christian, in God's house, we've got a picture of eating. Fatness is one of eating, of being full, of growing spiritually fat and drinking. Uh, of the rivers of God's pleasures and finding satisfaction and satiation in what? Not in their own achievements, but in the presence of God, in taking pleasure in the great God Almighty, in abiding in Christ, in remaining under the shadow of the Almighty. Uh, we find ourselves in God's house, which is the way God's always designed it, for us to find our greatest pleasures, our greatest comforts, our greatest solaces and encouragements as the word of God is preached, as we have fellowship with one another, as we confess our sins, as the blood of Christ cleanses us from all of our sins, as we do all of these things together as we're commanded, this beautiful picture of us growing fat and flourishing in the house of the Lord our God, drinking in of the wells of the, the Spirit, growing as we are fed on the Word of God. And I understand uh, that each one of us should be spiritually growing here today. Each one of us should be knowing what it is to feast in the presence of God and feast on the Word of God and undertake the means of grace, prayer and fellowship and uh, the, um, the means of grace that God has given to us uh, to, to grow thereby. And so we've got this wonderful, wonderful picture here where we are both sheltered by his wing and fed at his table. Let's be encouraged by that, church, that we are both sheltered by his wing, we are protected, and we are fed at his table, we are provided for. Well, how did Spurgeon see this? Well, he said it this way, Guarded by omnipotence, the chosen of the Lord are always safe. As they dwell in the holy place, hard by the mercy seat, where the blood was sprinkled of old, the pillar of fire by night, the pillar of cloud by day, which ever hangs over the sanctuary, covers them also. So this is the way Spurgeon saw it. I'll go on. In time, it, it is not written, in the time of trouble he shall hide me. It, sorry, is it not written, in the time of trouble he shall not hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. What better security can we desire, Spurgeon says. As the people of God, we are always under the protection of the Most High. Wherever we go, whatever we suffer, whatever may our difficulties, temptations, trials or perplexities, we are always under the shadow of the Almighty. 
End quote. What a beautiful picture that uh, Spurgeon has brought out there uh, in unison with where we're going here today in Psalm 36. Now, speaking of growing fat, flourishing, and drinking the rivers of pleasure in the house of God, of course, Jesus calls the house of God, my Father's house, it will be a house of prayer, another source of satisfaction. Some of you in the room that know the pursuit of prayer, the perseverance of prayer, know the pleasure of what it is to pray in the presence of God, to pray with the Lord, to pray to the Lord, to pray with the help of the Holy Spirit. And of course, as the high priest prayed under the shadow of the wings of the golden cherubim, which were extended over the Ark of the Covenant, so we as sinners, in a spiritual sense, are drawn near to the mercy seat. We're encouraged by the Apostle, aren't we, to enter the throne room of grace boldly. We've received mercy. We've received grace in our time of need that we may grow, uh, go and pray to the Lord and be satisfied with the fatness of his house. So praise the Lord for that. Isn't it interesting, if you think about the Ark for a minute, what was contained in the ark? What represented the presence of the Lord? Well, if you opened up the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, what would you find in it? Well, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4 tells us. You'd find the heavenly hidden manna in a jar. Now, all of these things point to he who is the person who would give us permanent access to the presence of God, Jesus and of course, Jesus is that heavenly hidden manna, the heavenly food who sustains us. We must eat of Christ's flesh. We must drink of his blood. That's what we do at the communion table, at the Lord's table. We again remind ourselves that our sustenance, our manna, our food, that which keeps us alive, that's what the manna did for the children in the wilderness, didn't it? It kept them alive. It kept them uh, sustained Yes, they wanted lots of different dietary requirements, but in the end, they lived off what gave them. God, God gave them, and it was one thing. It was one meal. And this is where we need to remind ourselves as Christians, we're not looking for anything other than Christ. We have one gospel. We have one Christ. We have one sacred person that we look to to feed us in our spiritual growth, the heavenly hidden manner. And then, of course, you'd also find uh, the rod that budded. Uh, the rod was a proof that Aaron had been called, that God calls men to the ministry. God calls them, he makes them fruitful, and he chooses them. And of course, in Christ, for us as believers, not, we're in the presence of God, not because we chose to be, but like Aaron, God called him, he chose him, and God makes us fruitful. So all of these things we need to remember that as a present sign that we're in the presence of God, God himself gets the glory for all of this. And then thirdly, we see in the Ark of the Covenant, representing of the presence of God, the tables of the covenant, don't we? The two tables of the covenant. That represents, of course, our Lord Jesus again as the living word, as the logos. He was the word, uh, and of course, he is the living word made flesh. So in time we see access to the permanent presence of God, whereas Christians in the book of Hebrews, we now take up our rest. We rest in the finished work of Christ. And we trust like the psalmist under the shadow of the wing of the Almighty. Verse 8, we shall drink from them these pleasures of the river. A river is a, doesn't have a start point necessarily it keeps going. And of course, Jesus referenced himself, drink of the rivers that will never run dry. It's this river that continues to flow. And it's a river of pleasures, plural, S. So the ongoing pleasures of serving Christ continue. Even if we suffer, even if we go through trial or tragedy, God has a way of making them pleasurable as we look to him, as we trust in him, and as we know that God is gracious to us. Now, if we look a little bit deeper in the Hebrew text here in verse 8 together, uh, it's, we, we are promised here uh, the Hebrew word for pleasures is the plural of Eden. The plural of Eden. Now, of course, when you know God made the Garden of Eden, he made it to be beautiful for Adam and Eve. All things were good, and they had pleasure in that garden. But here we are brought back to the fact that God himself will bring us back to a place of experiencing a new Eden, the way Jeremy Horn puts it here in his uh, 
little comment on this section. In heaven alone, the thirst of an immortal soul after happiness can be satisfied. There, the streams of Eden will flow again. To drink of that river, Revelation 22.1, this is where it's all going back to, the Lord's restoring it all. Uh, we understand, Horn says, to signify, to be favoured with an unclouded knowledge of God and a pure affection to him. Now in Revelation 11.19, you'll see it. The temple of God was opened in heaven. Here's the house of God again. So we see the fatness of his house. And then in his temple, the Ark of the Testament is there. The Ark of the Covenant is there. So God's presence will always be with his people and there'll be light and other analogies that come later out in the book of Revelation if you went on and read that. But this symbolizes God's presence, not just with the people of the Old Testament, his presence through the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, but his presence through the Ark again in the Old, uh, the way it was in the Old Testament as a picture of his presence with his people forever uh, in eternity. Jonathan, Jonathan Edwards says of this stream, of this river, which makes glad, makes the saint glad, he says, this is the stream of Christ's delights. So in glory, that stream represents all the beauties of who Jesus is, the river of his infinite pleasure, which he will make his saints to drink of with him. They shall partake with Christ of the same river of pleasure, shall drink of the same water of life and of the same new wine in the Father's kingdom. Matthew 26, 29. That new wine is especially that joy and happiness that Christ and his true disciples shall partake of together in glory, which is the purchase of Christ's blood or the reward of his obedience to death. What an encouraging couple of verses we have there, church. Now let's go on to our next section, the profession of the elect, verses 9 and 10. Have a look at it with me in your Bibles there. Uh, verse 9, for with you is the fountain of life, and in your light shall we see light. Verse 10, continue your loving kindness to them that know you and your righteousness to the upright in heart. Now, Let's have a look at it in the text. We see two critical things here in verse 9, life and light. Jesus is both the source of physical life and spiritual light. The Lord Jesus is the source of all life on earth and God indeed, the Father, created through the Son. Now we've got some verses here. We'll put them up on the screen for you. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 who has in his last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, watch this, by whom, through whom, he also made the worlds. So God the Father, through the Son, gave life, made all things. John 1, 3. Through him, all things were made, and without him, nothing was made that has been made. So in case you're not sure whether it did mean all things, John says it in a dual way here to show you that it was all things were made and without him nothing was made that has been made. John chapter 1 verse 10. He was in the world and, th and though he, the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. Very clear. John's gospel is telling us God created through the Son. John chapter 1, verse 4. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Here you've got the concept of both life and light. We know just in natural creation, if there was no light, there was no sun, there would be no life. There's no life in darkness. There's life in light. And so Jesus, spiritually speaking, is both life and light. He's in a natural sense as well, because God said that let there be light. There was light physically, but he is it here in a spiritual sense for the Christian in God's house under the shadow in trusting the Almighty. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, and this is the record that God has given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Now you may be with us this morning, Maybe you're not a Christian, maybe you're visiting, 
But the life, eternal life that's offered to you is only in Jesus Christ. It is only in the Son of the living God. It is only in Jesus Christ. There is only one way to salvation. There only ever has been one way to salvation. And for you here today, hearing me right now, I want you to hear that Jesus is the way, not a way. He is the truth, the life. You want eternal life? You must come through the Father to the Son. So let's remember that. Let's look to the Lord Jesus. John 5, 26. For as the Father has life in himself, so he is given to the Son to have life in himself. John 6, 57. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Here again, we've got so many scriptures. We could have kept on going here with passages, but just taking this from Psalm 36, verse 9, he is the fountain of life. This is a picture of not just God, but prophetically of Jesus. And in your light, we shall see the light. Here is one of the most beautiful verses found in Scripture. A beautiful verse, why? Because it magnifies the Lord Jesus. That in his light shall we see the light. Well, what does that mean? Sounds good. We know that Jesus is the light of the world. That's what he called himself. And that this light dispels the darkness. It's what light does. You turn the light on, darkness goes. The light of Christ dispels the darkness of sin, ignorance, death. But what does this double meaning say to us? That in your light we shall see the light. Well, Matthew Henry leads in and gives us a backdrop. He says, this is a dark world. We see little comfort in it. But in the heavenly light, there is true light and no false light. Light that is lasting and never wastes. So what does it mean then that in your light we shall see the light? Well, firstly, it means that all truth, that is all light given to the church, can be summed up and found in Christ. John eight twelve. I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. There's both light and life, not just in that verse, but in the whole picture of what we see here. He's the fountain of life, and we have light. So we've got, firstly, light is seen through the truth that can be found only in Christ. We live in a world where they say truth can be found anywhere and everywhere. You look deep enough in you, you can find the truth. That is a lie. Truth is found in God's word. It is found in Christ who is the living word. And we must base our lives on the truth of God's word. Everything else, when the storm and the winds and the waves come, will be swept away. There's only one sure foundation, saints, and that's to build your life on the light and life of God's word, the life of his son that was lived as a testimony and the light to the truth that we're to walk in. His light uh, is there for us to walk in. Secondly, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but secondly, the truths of scripture are meant by that light that we've been given. The word of God is a source of light, isn't it? A source of that light that points not only to Christ, but the spirit of God takes that word and illumines it. It illumines the pages of God's word. It's not just a dead letter. It's not just pages and ink. It's a living word, and it gives us light to walk in. Are we not told to walk in the light as he is in the light? How would we not do that if we didn't have God's word to read and to study and to know what to walk in? So we are to walk in the light as he is in the light. We know the psalmist also says in the psalms that, uh, we are to walk, uh, not just walk in the light as he is in the light, but his word is a light to our path and a lamp to our feet, isn't it? Thirdly, this beautiful passage, it means this, that no man can illumine his own soul. In your light, we shall see the light. Not in the light that I create, not in the light that I think I've come up with, now, you might get a good idea every now and again. Well, you can just thank the Lord for that as well because he's given you a mind, he's given you a brain, he's given you creative ability to think, and so you should give God glory for all of those things, amen. But in the end, 
We can't take credit for ourselves. It's only in the light that he gives us that we have any light at all. Amen? All right, so what we've got here is this picture that all or any understanding that we ever get comes from above. Maybe you can turn with me to the book of Matthew here for a minute. The Gospel of Matthew. We'll uh, have a look here in chapter 16. Pick it up at verse 15 of Matthew 16. Jesus says to them, but whom uh, do you say that I am? Now Simon Peter answers and said, well, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now he got that bit right. Jesus answered and said to him, before he could say anything else silly, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for what? Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You didn't come up with this idea on your own. This light that you got, you didn't get this on your own, but what? My Father, which is in heaven. You need the light of the Father to illumine, the work of the Spirit to illumine for you to know who God truly is, who the Son truly is. This is true of all salvation. Anybody who confesses Jesus Christ as Lord needs to have the Holy Spirit illumine that to them so they can actually see the truth, the light of the world. So this beautiful, beautiful scripture here that shows us that the gospel itself is the glorious light of the good news of Jesus Christ, that we are given, despite our sinful condition, light to see the only hope we have is in Christ, light to put faith in his saving name and light to walk in his ways as a proof that we have been saved to now serve him and do good works for his name's sake. Or put simply, you cannot know anything of eternal, empirical and spiritual truth apart from knowing Christ himself. Let me say that again. You cannot know anything of eternal, empirical and spiritual truth apart from knowing Christ himself. Jesus is the key to all truth, to all knowledge. The Puritans had this thing where they talked about a golden key and a wooden key. And what's the point of a golden key if it doesn't actually fit in the door and turn the lock and open it? And so they just said, even if it's wood, even if it's the most basic truth, we run with it because it's from God's word and it's light to our souls. We need to take that truth, the light of God's revealed word in that way. And by the way, any truth that contradicts Christ's teachings the truth of scripture is darkness and a lie don't say you walk in truth and do all these other things you're in darkness still first john tells us this is why when somebody is awakened from the deadness of their sins to a new life in christ they've been given light you know how some people say well i saw the light well technically that's true they were given spiritual light to see christ in a way that they'd never seen him before Even as a young man, I wasn't a Christian and I would take God's name in vain. I would say things that I would be ashamed of now. And of course, when the lights came on for me, when God graciously showed me Jesus Christ as my saviour, I no longer took the Lord's name in vain. I saw Jesus in a whole new light, in a whole new and living way. And of course, this is what Jesus, uh, sorry, Paul, uh, forgive me, calls the light of of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Well, I wonder as we're here, and I'm not finished just on this little section, in your light uh, we see light. Just turn with me forward to the book of Psalms, uh, to Psalm 104 for a minute. This is picture here where in your light we shall see the light and psalm 104 of verse 2 maybe we'll pick it up at verse 1 bless the lord O my soul o, o lord my god you are very great you are clothed with honor and majesty who covers yourself with light as with a garment who stretches out the heavens like a curtain now the psalmist is using visual imagery here but he's saying the only way that we see God 
is when he covers himself with light as with a garment. God would clothe himself as with a garment of light. Well, what's meant here? What, how do we mean by in your light we see light uh, and the whole notion here of God clothing himself with light? Well, as we know, if you've done your sort of theology 101 here, God is a spirit. So you can't see him. So he's invisible to the naked eye. But the psalmist tells us here that to make himself visible, what does he do? He clothes himself with light to give off a visible form. He, as the psalmist puts it, wears light to be visible. Yes, God himself, when he reveals himself, the great Yahweh clothes himself with light to give an aura, if you like, of visibility because... He is the invisible God, eternally. He can only be seen when he covers himself with his invisible essence, which is light. God is light. Now in Exodus 24, 17, for time's sake, we don't have a chance to turn there, but we read the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop. So God was there, and he was there because he was lit up like fire. Uh, John MacArthur uh, says it this way. Whenever anyone has seen God, whether it was on the mount in the Old Testament, Mount Sinai, or whether it was on the mount in the New Testament, the Mount of Transfiguration, they saw light, brilliant, shining, blazing, fiery light. And that is why we think of God as a shining glory, because that is in fact how he revealed himself. End quote. Hope you're getting a lot out of this, saints. Uh, the Lord is uh, gracious. He is incredible when we think about how good he is in giving his presence to us, in giving us his life and his light. Verse 10. Uh, continue your loving kindnesses to those that know you. This is the same loving kindness found in verse 7 of Psalm 36. Uh, may we not only know this loving kindness... Uh, the psalmist is talking about, but may it continue to keep us who know you as the loving and a kind God. These are the blessings for those in Christ who know him are, and are to be found in him. God, By the way, God isn't just loving and kind once to his people or twice. His loving kindness continues with his people, always and forevermore, amen. I mean, his covenant promises and pledges are for a thousand generations to those who seek him and call on his name. Now, these are promises for the elect, as we've pointed out in our uh, sermon title uh, in this section, the chosen ones who are in the light and walk in the light as he is in the light. And this is what it is to know him. Have a look in verse 10. Those who know you. Those who know you have life, they have light, and they walk in that light because they have new life. That it is, that's what it is to know him. Now, this know is an, in, uh, an intimate word here. It means to be known of him. It is to be his own, his own offspring, his own people. We love him and obey him and his loving kindness is to us because he first loved us. He showed his loving kindness to us. Verse 10 also goes on and says, not only will the loving kindnesses of God continue with those who know and trust under the shadow of the Almighty, but their righteousness will be given to the upright in heart. God's righteousness to the upright in heart. Notice it's not your righteousness. Now you are to live righteously. You're to live rightly before God. You're to obey the word of the Lord. But it's never your righteousness. All the righteousness we ever have is given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our sanctification, our righteousness, uh, and all of those other things as mentioned in 1 Corinthians. And so what we've got here is this picture of we are upright in heart because of your righteousness. Notice that those who have new life will have a new heart. We are given an upright heart. We must be given a new heart as Christians because our inclinations otherwise are not good. Our heart is corrupt, it's wicked, it's deceitful above all things. We know that. And Ezekiel 36, 26 tells us that the Christian must be given a regenerated heart, a new heart, not a heart of stone, but a heart of flesh. The light of the gospel must have already entered in uh, there must be a true hungering and then thirsting for righteousness, 
So what happens when we're a Christian walking in the line, the life of God, and we are looking for uh, ways to please the Lord in righteous living? Psalm 97 verse 11, wonderful verse here that we can look at. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. So the mind is illumined and the heart is awakened. Christianity is not one just of the head. We are given light. We are given life. But we are also given a new heart to serve the Lord. A heart that is after him. A heart that wants to please him. Now let's just remember, Christianity is a heart religion. It is not a head religion as such. We serve the Lord and worship him with our mind, but we must obey him from the heart. So what we've got here is this notion that God, when he looks on a believer, doesn't necessarily look at our head or our hands or our feet. He looks at our heart. He looks at our heart. As Paul says, the inner man of the heart. This is how the Lord judges our righteous actions, the righteousness that we do to bring him glory. And yes, it is possible to do the right thing the wrong way, to be doctrinally correct and do it with a wrong spirit. So we've got to be careful here as Christians, don't we? We can get all about being righteous, but we've got to be careful. We're told in Scripture not to be overly righteous or not to promote our self-righteousness as the Pharisees did. And this is why our uprightness of heart, our humility of heart, upright in the sight of the Lord, keeps us humble in our righteous endeavours for the Lord. Amen. So what we've got now, let's have a look at it, is we've got to be on the lookout as Christians because our heart can go awry. We're told to guard our heart. Now, just because you're told in Psalms that those who know the Lord, or those who are righteous in Christ, are upright in heart, it doesn't mean you don't have to monitor your heart because your heart can get sideswiped. Your heart can get detoured. Your heart needs to be guarded. The inner man of the heart needs to be guarded. Remember, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Jesus said, out of the heart come all of these evil things. You need to watch your heart. And so maybe we could find ourselves as Christians, instead of serving out of a pure heart or a humble heart or a broken and contrite heart before the Lord, we've got to be careful because we're warned not to harden our hearts towards the brethren, towards the Lord, or to have a deceitful heart. We're warned not to have a perverse or a pride-filled heart. We're warned not to have a foolish heart, thinking we know better, or a darkened heart, closing our own heart and internal instincts from the word of God and its counsel. We're told not to have a covetous or a calloused heart. Some of us in the room know what it's like for our heart to desire things that aren't meant to be ours. We want our neighbour's goods. We want our neighbour's stuff. And we've got to be careful we don't have a coveting heart or a calloused heart where we harden our heart to those things that are right and good and true. A froward heart, a perverse heart, a bitter heart, a wicked heart. Saints, let us be careful that we guard our hearts lest we fall into dangerous snares of the enemy. And lastly, as we close out here, thirdly, the pronouncement on the wicked. Verses 11 and 12. Let not the foot of pride come against me. Let not the hand of the wicked remove me. There are the workers of iniquity fallen. They are cast down and shall not be able to rise. The psalmist now commits the wicked to the Lord, asking for them not to prevail against him, not to remove him, not to get their way for their evil plans to come to fruition. He asks in both prayer and song, for both hand and feet of the wicked to be stopped, bound, removed. They intend an outward work against him, and he prays to the Lord that it would either be confounded or ceased. The confounding is in verse 11. The ceasing is in verse 12. Notice in verse 11, we've got a picture here of not let the foot of pride come against me, not let the hand of the wicked remove me. Pride and wickedness. Let me put it this way, give you an equation this morning. Pride equals wickedness. Or pride is sin. 
in and of itself. This is why the Lord hates pride. He hates it when it wells up in our own hearts, when we think of ourselves more highly than we ought. And the wicked are always represented as those being proud, something we want to stay away from as believers. Right? So right now, let's have a look at other parts of Scripture that talk to us about how pride and wickedness are dynamically linked in a very bad way to only typify the wicked. Job 40 verse 12, Look at all who are proud and humble them, and humble them. Crush the wicked where they stand. Psalm 75 verse 4, I say to the proud, do not boast, and to the wicked, do not lift up your horn. And Proverbs 21 4, Haughty eyes and a proud heart, the guides of the wicked are sin. So let's just deal with that right now. Anything prideful, anything where man is lifted up and puffed up, it's sinful. It may feel good to our flesh. It may impress other people. But we're to remain humble, not prideful. David goes on in verse 12. There are workers of iniquity fallen. They're cast down and shall not be able to rise. What do we see here? We see the psalmist's hope. He sees the transgression. He sees in verse 1, you could go back right back to verse 1. David has seen their transgression of the wicked. He's seen the wicked of their heart. And right at the end of the psalm, like bookends, David sees the end of their transgression, the end of their iniquity. We see the end of the sinner. In verse 1, transgression is in their heart. In the end, in verse 12, the workers of iniquity lay fallen on the battlefield of sin. They have reaped the wages of sin, which is death. They are cast down. They shall not be able to rise. They are fallen. Their own sins will mete out the physical death upon their bodies that they have reaped, or they will reap what they have sown. They will not rise from their graves to go to glory to be with the elect. They will be cast down to hell where they will be forever, never able to rise. Saints, God is a just judge. He rewards the righteous he punishes the wicked. There are only two types of people in all of human history, the righteous and the wicked. Those who follow Christ and are to be found in him and will go to glory. Those who reject Christ, even by ignoring Christ, you reject him. And so, friend here today, if you're not a Christian, let me plead with your eternal soul. Turn to Christ. Do not die in your sins because if you do, you will have no one to blame but yourself. You will fit the picture of verse 12. A worker of iniquity, fallen, cast down, unable to rise again. Nobody comes back from hell. You cannot rise from that place. You cannot go back. And in all of this, David is contrasting the Christian who will rise to the heights of glory with the downfall of the workers of iniquity. The rewards of the righteous living and walking in the light with those of pursuing a prideful life of wickedness, having no fear of God before your eyes. Well, what is the Lord's attitude towards the workers of iniquity? You say, well, you know, this is the psalmist and he's angry at wicked people or evil people or people who won't repent. But where does, where does it say God has an issue with this type of person? Well, Psalm 5.5, 5, you hate all workers of iniquity. Genesis 6.5, God saw that the wickedness of man was very great in the earth and punished them through the great Noahic flood. Psalm chapter 7, verse 11, God is angry with the wicked every day. There's not a day that goes by that God doesn't see the sin and the mind and the heart and the hands and the feet of what the wicked have done. This is why the psalmist reminds God, look at what their feet have done, where it's taken them. Look at what their hands have worked against the people of God. From his serene shelter, McLaren, great sort of uh, commentarian and preacher, Alexander McLaren, says, from the psalmist's serene shelter, under the wing of the Almighty, the psalmist looks out on the rout of battled foes and sees the end which gives the lie to the oracle of transgression and its flatteries, end quote. So in conclusion... Let us be sober today by seeing that the life of the righteous man is contrasted with that of the wicked man. The writer of Proverbs tells us, Proverbs 29, 16, it's up on the screen there, when the wicked thrive, so does sin, but the righteous 
will see their downfall. Saints right now in this world, the wicked seem to thrive. They get their sinful way. But at the end of this psalm is the end of all humanity. This is like a picture of human history. And by verse 12, we see that we, the righteous, will stand back and see the reward and the punishment of the wicked where they lay slain on the battlefield of their own sin, fallen, cast down, unable to rise. Then we will say how the mighty have fallen. George Lawson, in his commentary in Proverbs, reminds us, As we close out this morning, there is no disease more fatal or more infectious than sin. When the generality of men are profane, the restraints of shame are removed from sin and wicked men thrive. The Christian must possess a spirit like that of Noah or Lot, who are untainted by the spread of this contagion. When wicked men possess authority, the danger is extreme. The countenance which they give to sin is a dreadful temptation which few have the resolution and courage to resist. Lawson goes on here and talks about it. Obadiah in the court and 7,000 worshippers of the Lord in the kingdom of Ahab were more than Elijah could have dreamed of. The abundance of wickedness in such evil times is very distressing to the righteous, but they have the comfortable prospect of seeing the fall of the wicked. God is their enemy. That's the wicked's enemy. And although he bears with them for a time, yet he has doomed them to destruction. Now listen carefully. I'm about to finish the Lawson quote here. Their iniquity, that is of the wicked, shall come into remembrance with the Lord, and when the measure of it is full, they shall be swept away with the broom of destruction. The righteous, that is you and I, shall see their fall and shall rejoice. Not that they entertained hatred to the wicked, for they ardently desired their repentance, but because their fall is in a check to wickedness or against wickedness and an evidence that there is a God who reigns in the earth and has an invariable love for righteousness. End quote. Lawson is pointing us to the fact that in the end, God will punish all wickedness because of his righteous justice. And we don't love that idea that the wicked will be judged and destroyed, but we love the fact that righteousness ultimately will be served. What's the gospel challenge? Well, it's been embedded throughout the message, but friend here today, if you are one of those who still remain in the darkness of your unrepentant sin, have you today heard, and I know you have, about that light that can be given to you, a glorious hope, rather than an impending downfall of the wicked, a saviour who can save you from your sins this very day if you call out on him? rather than those sins being the cause of your eternal damnation? Would you today acknowledge Christ as the light of the world, as the truth, as the way, the hope of your eternal soul, by confessing your need of him? You cannot save yourself. You must repent of your sins. Put your faith in Christ and him alone. May the goodness of God be with each one of us today as we remember the blessings of the righteous and the sure punishment of the wicked, and that God is sovereign over all. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you today for your loving kindness towards your people, the kindness you show towards the children of men, even those who are still to repent and turn to you, whom you show patience and kindness towards. May each one of them do so before they perish and die in their sins. Thank you for the promises we have for those who love you and put their trust in the shadow of the Almighty. That we will be like those who are protected and covered by your wings, being fed and nourished in the fatness and pleasure of your house, drinking of the rivers of blessing and favour and providence over our lives. May you help us to walk in that light as he is in the light and may we continue in the way of truth and uprightness of heart. We ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, please stand for the reading of the benediction. And many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, but others to everlasting shame and contempt. Then the wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, And those who lead many to righteousness will shine 
like the stars forever and ever. Amen. Blessings, church. I'll hand you back over to the host now, and may you enjoy the rest of the Lord's day, bringing him glory for his name's sake. Amen.